Can a news publisher take a photograph that you've posted to Instagram and then using the internets and computer code, publish it without your permission? Today on the podcast, we're going to talk about two attorneys that are fighting against just that. Stay tuned. This is the Wedding Industry Law Podcast, a podcast dedicated to wedding professionals that are just trying to keep it legal. And now, your host, Rob Shank. Hello out there. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, we have a information-packed podcast about copyright, about Instagram, about what rights you may forfeit with the terms and conditions of Instagram. So much, so much. But before we get into it, please, 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 pretty please, like and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get it. If you watch it on YouTube, like and subscribe, leave a comment. I would love to hear from you. If you have suggestions for content for the show, please hit me up. You can shoot me an email or hit me up on any one of those uh, social media platforms. Speaking of social media, speaking of social media, today on the podcast, we're talking about um, a case out of the Southern District of New York involving a photographer, Stephanie Sinclair. So Stephanie Sinclair is a professional photographer. She does a lot of work for National Geographic. And at, at some point, she posted a photo on her Instagram account, which is, you know, what we do, you know, millions of times a day. I know I'm posting photos all the time. And because she's good at what she does, people want to use her photos. And so at some point, a company called Mashable came along. Mashable, I guess, is kind of like a news outlet. You, you know what Mashable is. Mashable wanted to write an article about female photographers. And so they wanted representations of the female photographers. And so they came to Stephanie and said, hey, can we use that awesome photograph that you took? And she said, no way, Jose. And so Mashable said, fair enough. We'll see you later. Um, without Stephanie's knowledge, um, Mashable went in using the terms and, well, allegedly using the, well, not say allegedly, they did use through the terms of service of Instagram. They went into the back end and got code of that photograph. And using the code, and we'll get into this later on in the episode about what code is and what embedding is, um, they went ahead and did the article, talked about Stephanie, and used the code such that going to the article on the Mashable website, the photo would appear. And again, we'll get into, you know, what's the difference between just using the photo and using the code, but that's ended up, that's what happened. And so Stephanie, at some point later on, found out about it and obviously was a little upset. So, you know, the, she uh, filed suit, um, claiming that this is a violation of, the, among other things. And again, we'll get into this a little bit later on, but allegedly, or I'm sorry, um, alleging that this is a violation of the terms of service of Instagram and this is a copyright infringement, that, that they didn't have the right to use this no matter what is on Instagram or what I agree to with Instagram. So today on the program, um, we are actually, I'm so lucky, like this is awesome, like I feel like a real journalist almost. But I tracked down the attorneys representing Miss Sinclair in this specific case. Um, and they agreed to come on the podcast. So I'm so happy to have them on the show. We're going to be talking about where the case is right now. We're going to be talking about, you know, the basics, you know, why this is important and what what you can do as an as an Instagram user, as a photographer, to possibly, you know, maybe protect yourself until we get a clear resolution in this case or until we get a clear understanding, or I'm sorry, until Instagram cleans up its act. Um, so so lucky to have these guys. These are veteran copyright infringement litigators, Brian Hoban and James Bartolome. Um, Brian Hoban left a career in corporate finance for one in international human rights, eventually becoming an attorney working within the UN treaty body system. 
In 2012, he, he co-founded Too Young to Wed, a global nonprofit organization dedicated to eradicating child marriage and protecting girls' rights. Increasingly, though, Brian found himself drawn to the plight of independent photographers fighting against rights-grabbing contracts and unauthorized usage. Following this growing passion, Brian founded his own law practice in 2018 to focus on the legal needs of independent creatives, journalists, artisans, and their small businesses. He is privileged to represent some of the world's most talented issue-driven creatives, including several iconic National Geographic photographers and filmmakers. Brian lives in New York's lower Hudson Valley with his wife, two young children, and their slightly overweight dogs. I can attest to that, the dog part. James Bartolome has spent more than a decade representing value-based entrepreneurs, green startups, artists, blockchain community members, individuals, and established small businesses in a variety of legal matters and business development. He also represents individuals and families for the Duncan firm for defective products, business cases, and catastrophic personal injury. As of counsel at Duncan Firm, James represents startup clients in Venice, California, as well as New York City, with a focus on business development of sustainable and value-based legal services. He also represents several prominent photographers and copyright claims related to their photos appearing in international media publications. Did I say that these guys are experienced and have the credentials or what? I'm so happy to have them both on here. What a coup I have pulled off. The two attorneys representing Miss Sinclair against Mashable, James and Brian, welcome to the show. Hi there, there Rob, you thank you so much. <laughs> all right. Um, fantastic. First of all, I mean, this is very rare that I have guests. It's even more rare that I got two at the same time. But um, I've introduced you guys so the audience knows what's going on. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm just going to launch right into it. Um, the, the very first question, this is for either of you, um, if you to, to, to take a go at it, but just from a general idea, what is a copyright? And then setting this case aside, does posting a photo, that, and we'll just assume that you own the copyright to the photo, so what's a copyright? And then setting this case aside that we're going to talk about, how does posting that to Instagram affect your copyright or affect your rights in that photo, if at all? Hmm. Why don't you take that, Brian? Yeah. Okay, Brian. Uh, the basic, yeah. The base, the base idea is you know, copyright is essentially an, a term of ownership in in a work that you author, be it photo, a sculpture, painting, you know, film, you name it. Any any anything in the pantheon of creation, you is uh, owner. You only have ownership. Your rights vest automatically. Your your copyright vests in that automatically. Uh, in the work when you create it and there's a million different avenues to go down about creation and what if you create something along with somebody else but we're not going to go down that rabbit hole now um, but one of the big aspects of that is um, what the copyright act uh, gives you and the copyright act is is is, is the act of congress and uh, again, there's a million rabbit holes that go down with that, but the basic concept is in order to take advantage of the Copyright Act's uh, the provisions, you have to register your work. And you register the work, your work with the Copyright Office, your photographer, you register your photos, uh, and they assign you a number and a, you know, a little, little coded number. And once you have that in hand, uh, you can avail yourself of the court system. And why is that beneficial? Uh, that gives you if somebody uh, if somebody in, without authorization uses your work, uh, you have a, the keys to the to the courthouse. You can walk in and use that to to get bigger damages than you would have otherwise without this without this recourse. You have statutory damages under the Copyright Act, which amplifies what you otherwise would be able to. You know, in a state, you know, the, the Copyright Act is you have to go to federal court in, in different states, and without that, you'd be stuck in state court with, with you know, a, a smaller cudgel should somebody have uh, ripped off your work. Um, and it, uh, that's a breezy, very, very like hundred thousand foot view of how that all works, but it's a good way to start talking about it. Right. So, if I understand correctly, the idea of copyright is that it's kind of like 
um, a group of rights that go along with a photo or a work of, of some a painting, whatever the case may be. And typically, right. without that, um, your um, ability to get compensation or your ability to, and you know prevent somebody from using that is a little bit lessened if I understand correctly. And you can go to federal court if you've, if you've registered it and um, we can talk about that in another episode. So I think we have an idea of yeah. copyright. So like how, how does the, the idea of copyright um, intersect with um, Instagram or social media in general, but we'll just stick to Instagram if it's really different. Like I, I have a copyright, let's say that I've registered that copyright. I go on Instagram, have I given up those rights? Like, did, can anybody, you know, share it and use it? That kind of thing. How, how, how does that work? And that's for anybody. Great. Well, yeah, so. When, Am I on mute? Okay, sorry about that. Are you, you want to jump in there? Or you... Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm happy to share some thoughts on that. So if you take it from, of the big picture view, Instagram tries to make it, you know, abundantly clear in uh, in the in the fancy legal lease that they've got written when you sign up to use it, to make it uh, that you still own that copyright, meaning that photograph, especially from a photographer's perspective, is one that still is owned by you, whether you register it or not. Where things sort of change from your rights is, you know, is the idea that you're you're giving up the ability, at least according to Instagram's terms, for them to go use it in a way that they can share it within their platform. Uh, although it's, you know, one of the reasons why you're talking to us today is where it's unclear whether <clears throat> what are the rights other companies or people, individuals, media publishers or whatnot, you know, have as opposed to the copyrights that you retain. So there's, so the short answer is you still own the copyright. You still go get to use it in other settings. You get to go sell it. You get to go sell it to your clients. You get to like, you know, in the form of a license uh, or if it's, you know, if you're, if you're um, giving them, assigning them the copyright, uh, but but fundamentally, you still retain that copyright ownership interest, regardless of what platform you put it on, whether it be Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, what have you. Okay, so if if I understand correctly, then you, you, the the owner of the copyright posted on Instagram, they still own the copyright, but now they're operating within whatever the rules that Instagram has. So that might be a matter of, I think you said something about, um, you know, allowing Instagram to, to um, post it on whatever their platforms. Can you, and, and I know that's a gray area, but can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Like what, what, what can Instagram, um, at least setting this case aside for a second, what, what, what could Instagram do under those terms of service? Well, under, under the rights that you're giving, there's your basically assigning to them, uh, you know, they can't sell that photo. And, you know, the, the idea of, of selling the photo as a license for, you know, to monetize, you know, it's, it's got a legal term of, of art, but just from the, from the layperson's perspective, uh, they can share that photo within, you know, their platform, uh, you know, through a number of different, you know, mechanisms, whether it be, uh, other users going and, and, and sharing it, uh, whether it be a, uh, you know, a, a publisher. And, and that's where, you know, I, I think there's, there's significant confusion of what exactly uh, Instagram is giving to those third parties or to, to others um, that are on the platform and have basically agreed to the same um, the same set of rules that you do when you post. So for instance, you can't be on Instagram um, and do all the different things that publishers do without actually being a user is, you know, is our understanding. I see. And that's actually um, would be a good segue into this case. At the top of the show, I kind of gave a, um, a kind of overview 
of the case itself. But one of the things that um, was kind of confusing to me, and I think might be uh, was kind of at, all right, start, start over. over. Start over. <laughs> start that, start that second, second over. Okay, I'm gonna put my hand up to edit. Okay, so I'm getting. Okay, is so it still there? I'm getting a little. Okay, I think the feedback is gone. Better. Yeah, I was. My 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 cell phone was sort of fluttering through my connection, but I'm on now. No worries. Okay, great. You look. It looks better, and and I mean, it, you are. You sounded good anyway. So the audio is great. Okay. Um. Okay. So. Um. Thank you, James. That's that's a, actually a good segue um, because I t at the top of the show, I kind of brushed on the facts of the case, and that's why I brought you guys on this week. Um, but one of the issues that I was having, and, I, and I'm assuming this is kind of at least one of the principal issues, is this word embedding and Instagram, I guess, giving a license to Mashable to embed photos. Can you kind of like talk us through what it means to embed why where a server is matters this type of thing brian you want to take that yeah well yeah, in, embedding is is essentially a uh it's a it's it's a let's go let's go back up to ten thousand feet with this one it's it's technological process by which uh people can you know in the instagram context using through the api which is the technical term for their for the, for the system, you pull out so a coding used through the Instagram site, and you can essentially use that as a as, you know, plug it into your own website, and it creates a window essentially into back over to Instagram to display on your page uh, that original photo as posted on Instagram. Uh, where this is important is that you're not downloading a version of that image it doesn't reside in your computer or your server anywhere it's just it's just basically a, a series of a code that opens a window is the easiest way to really explain that and why uh why would that be important um there's a, a line of cases out of the ninth circuit um in northern california i think it originated and uh the basis there is saying that because it doesn't reside on the server it's just kind of open in this window to show it on your website that's not considered infringement because you haven't physically or, you know, clicked and, and, and taken those, you know, the bits of data and moved them over to your computer and then reposted them uh, because that's not happening. The court found uh, that that wasn't infringement. And it's a, a line of cases. I think it's the perfect 10 line uh, out of California. And there's been a lot of pushback uh, in the, here in the, in the East Coast, in the Second Circuit. Uh, we have not adopted that. Um, and there's for a variety of reasons. Um, which is probably outside the purview of this uh, podcast, but well, uh, yeah, I don't want to get it is like too too wonky in that. But for all intents and purposes, if I'm if I'm understanding this correctly, they're from a user interface standpoint, from the person going to Mashable, okay, and clicking on the Mashable website, the URL, there is almost from their perspective zero difference between taking that JPEG or taking the file and putting it on, and Mashable taking the JPEG, putting it on our website, or Mashable taking the code or whatever the, you know, whatever the, you know, I don't know, Johnny Five, you know, Skynet code and putting it on the website. From my perspective as the user of the Mashable website, the consumer, no difference. So I have to assume that's the problem then, right? So even though it, it, it's a big difference from Mashable side code versus I'm just going to take the picture and from you and use it, the end result's the yeah. same. Yeah, and this this is this is the difference. This is this is what a lot of the, the Second Circuit you know, lower court reasoning has been about, and that is the case uh, the. Uh, uh, the the Breitbart case, uh, Goldman versus Breitbart, uh, last year hinged on that, and this is a lower court decision out of the Southern District of New York, uh, and, uh, and but it's not controlling. But controlling, but we saw was a rejection of that server idea, saying no, yeah, sure, it's not, it's just a window; it doesn't reside in your computer. But to the layperson, for all intents and purposes, it sure as hell looks like it sits there, and 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 that is in violation of one of those bundle of rights under the Copyright Act, which is you know your 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 right to the display right. Uh, which, which you know, for all intents and purposes, it's being displayed on that website, and you can't, the layperson can't tell the difference. Uh, and so, yeah. 
that that's you know, that's the rationale coming out, and we, you know it's it's setting up. Most of us think there's you know eventually going to be a circuit split, which is going to lead to a Supreme Court decision to really iron this out because the the, the different coasts. It's the, you know it's the uh, old '90s rap feud of the the West and East Coast. Uh, <laughs> hey oh. But um, so you, you got know, two two I, I saying, like, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just, I just in the next five years, I think I think we're going to see some significant movement up the chain, and we're going to get some some better direction than we have now. Okay, so I think that for many people, it's hard to fathom, especially in, in my audience, but it's hard to fathom why any court is is even caring about the code versus the end result, which is you see an image that you don't have the right to. So mm -hmm. what's the argument on the other side? Like what, what is Mashable saying? Well- And the Ninth Circuit, well, like what was the rationale of the Ninth Circuit, I guess, or whatever Mashable saying? It's really, Rob, it's really fact specific. So from, from the, uh, the general public's perspective, uh, like you mentioned, they don't know that when they're looking at an article and they see a photo, whether it's sitting on Mashable server or Mashable, just put it right in the, directly into the, to the article. What Mashable's position is, and what's different from say the, the uh, the case, case that Brian mentioned, you know, the Goldman case, which everyone is uh, is concerned about on you know the publisher side, is what exactly is Mashable getting when they get when they when they use the Instagram platform? So when they enter that sandbox, if you if you if you visualize a sandbox and it's gotten certain rules in it that you have to play by, Mashable saying we have rules that we believe let us go grab anything we want on the Instagram platform. If someone's got a public image, excuse me, a public account, we can go use that and we can go uh, make it look like it's sitting in an article that we're writing, uh, that we're publishing. And most of the photography, you know, so, so they're saying it doesn't matter. We don't need your permission. We don't need to go ask you. We don't need to go license your photo. We can just get onto Instagram. Instagram gives us that that right to go grab anything and make it appear magically. I'm gonna say, you know, I'm using that a little bit sarcastically through the embed, you know, feature. So, you know, someone in the public who reads that article, they have no idea whether it's sitting on Instagram servers or Mashable did it directly. And you know, that's that's basically their argument. We did Miss Sinclair, who is our, you know, Brian's and my client. We never ha even had to ask you mm. for permission to do to use that that photo in our article because Instagram gave us that right, gave us that authority, gave us that permission. Yeah. And just just to just to kind of just to walk you through that, the, their argument is that the general user signs up for the Instagram account, and in those terms of service with Instagram, Instagram re reserves the right to sublicense your image. Uh, they don't explain how or where or, or, or why and what circumstance, but they reserve that right. And then on the back end, using this embedding API feature, anybody who uses that, uh, Insta uh, Mashable's argument was by virtue of that agreement, we're allowed to grab whatever we want and post it on our website you know, alongside revenue generating advertisements. And uh, so. And, and, I, I don't mean to cut you off then. So, do, okay. So does that mean that this idea um, hinges on the terms and conditions of whatever the social media account that you're using is, or is there, if let, if you took that away, let's say that Instagram did not give you any, it did not give Mashable or the publisher any rights at all. Is there somewhere where code resides that you could get and we'd be in the same situation, but outside of any type of, terms and conditions of a of an instant me, inst, or social media account does that make sense like are we going to get there one day where i can just get the code to you know whatever pulitzer prize photo there is on the internet even though it's not within a social media account i guess i would say the short answer is that's always existed and it would and it will always exist as long as there are i'm not going to use this term uh in, in, in probably the proper sense. And as long as there's hackers out there that have the ability to go scrape content from the internet, it's always going to exist. Yeah. But so long as we've got the Copyright Act, that's, you know, that's your bodyguard. 
in terms of protecting your intellectual property rights. So, you know, in, in, in this instance, you know, we did allege uh, copyright infringement uh, because our client owned, owns, owns the rights to that photo. But just because, you know, Instagram, you know, may have a set of rules and then there are people playing outside of, you know, th th those rules, that, you know, there's, there's still gonna exist people that can go on to the platform. Now, Instagram has gotten as, you know, you know they're, they're uh, I don't know, about a 10 year old or so company now, and they've gotten more sophisticated. I mean, they're obviously the parent company's Facebook. So um, they, they, go, they take great lengths to tell everybody, hey, if you're doing any of those things that you described, illegally scraping content off of the Instagram platform without going through basically the front door, you know, think of it like a thief going through the back door, you know, or breaking in through a window and taking the content out. You know, Instagram saying, listen, we're going to give you the key, but you're going to go, you're going to go through it, um, through the door the right way. Um, so it's not unlimited rights to go, you know, take content off. But yes, to answer your question, Rob, there, there's always going to be bad actors in the world that can scrape content off of social media platforms. Uh, whether it be a Pulitzer Prize photo or, you know, a, a beautiful wedding shot, uh, that's going to happen. And that's why, you know, lawyers exist to, yeah. you know, hopefully, you know, be able to help photographers enforce those rights. And there's even talks right now of a small claims court within the copyright world to deal with smaller claims because it's, it's cost prohibitive to try to enforce every single time somebody rips one of your photos off, you know, hire a lawyer and, you know, if it's the case isn't worth enough, the lawyer's not going to take it, or you're not going to spend hourly fee just to go pursue something. So the bad actors are always going to exist, unfortunately. I, I understand. That makes sense. So I, I guess if I understand what you're saying, this is almost like the court is trying to figure out the extent of the terms that the parties have agreed to between the user or the photographer and Instagram itself versus it seems, if I understand what you're saying, is that outside of social media, if I went and got code to a photograph and did everything that, that, that Mashable did, and it displays on my website, it's on another server or whatever, that would still be copyright infringement. The issue here is yeah. whether or not Instagram has given Mashable license to get the code within the terms and conditions and the user, uh, user rights of Instagram, I guess, right? Right. Presently, okay. presently, what the case is, that's 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 what we're we're arguing now. We're saying that the the the, the, the terms do not say this, and they're saying the terms do say this. Uh, if we clear that hurdle, then we move on to a whole different area of law that we kind of talked about a little while ago uh, with display right and whatnot. Uh, okay. Yeah. But yeah. If, yep. if, if if they were if they were to say if they instead of Instagram, if they were to use go to like Stephanie's professional page, Stephanie Sinclair, a client, if they were to go to her, instead of gone to her professional page where she hosts some images, invites offers for licensing those images, if they would have, you know, right click and, and gotten the coding to that and pulled it over and, and put it on their website, uh, th this would be a very different story. Uh, you know, that would have been much more nakedly infringement. We wouldn't be arguing about terms of service. Yeah. Gotcha. It, it, well, only thing I would also add is um, it's not automatic copyright infringement because publishers that go take other people's work, uh, they may have other defenses. And, you know, that's a whole other area of fair use. Like if a news publisher takes a photo and it's got newsworthiness, I mean, there's probably about four major factors with sub factors underneath oh, each, each of those that, you know, they can raise all those defenses and say, um, you know, so sad, too bad, you can't get us. It's not copyright infringement. So, yeah, it's, can, it's not always going to be automatic. Let's tack a whole another hour onto the podcast and talk about very <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, with regard to wh where where we're going, where we're headed, what what's the um, kind of what should users and particularly photographers and creatives, what should we be worried about, or is there anything that we can do using Instagram to prevent this from happening? Because it's not right. Like, I mean, like it's not right that you go on a website and see your photograph and you're not compensated. I think there's, Brian and I can talk about probably three different areas. Um, there's litigation, which is what we have right now. And we're hoping that this court uh, will reconsider, you know, its, its decision um, because there are probably three or four, what well, we see areas on appeal that Mashable, just because they go get to go take those photos 
they still have certain responsibilities and rules that they have to play by. Like they've got to take the photo down within 24 hours if the user tells them. They've got to uh, abide by any restrictions or requirements that the user places. Now where we don't know, you know, you're asking what are photographers doing? Uh, you know, is, does it have any legal effect for the photographer to place within the caption or on the photo directly that if you want to republish this photo or re reuse it or redisplay it somewhere, come to me and pay a license. Mm -hmm. And what nobody's really certain about is does that have any legal effect? Because within Instagram's rules, Mashable is required to abide by you as the owner of that photo's requirements. Um, and then, you know, Brian, there's, you know, there's obviously, you want to talk about, you know, legislation and uh, the, uh, and, the, and, you know, the PR campaign, or at least Instagram, maybe making some changes. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, a lot of the photographers rights organizations, uh, ASMP and PPA, and uh, a host of others, are, are, are have come together, you know, in trying to get one voice into requesting Instagram, lobbying them to, to, to add a feature similar to what you see in YouTube. If you're a YouTube user, you can just flip one little switch that says allow embedding, don't allow it on an a la carte basis, you know, a per, a per post basis. Uh, and, you know, you don't have that option in Instagram. Um, and so lobbying them to make that change uh, it is, is things that are happening now behind the scenes. I don't know if we're seeing any movement on that or not, um, I, I, which certainly hope so. Um, we see, I think a good, a good analogy to kind of what, what, what the industry is trying to do from my understanding. Again, we don't represent the entire industry. We have one client, but we are plugged into the greater discussion. And so I think a lot of people are drawing an analogy to back in 2012, where you saw one of the big players in Instagram, uh, Perennially, perennially is uh, National Geographic, and uh, they, they have massive amount of viewers, 130 something million at this point. Uh, but in back in 2012, um, uh, we saw Instagram floated some ideas for changing their terms of service, which would have allowed them to commercially license your image, anybody's images. Uh, uploaded to Instagram, and obviously there was huge backlash by professional photographers on there. Uh, and that manifested in, in uh, Nat Geo, whose Instagram account at that point was only about 600,000 uh, subscribers, but was still back in 2012, that was a sizable number. Uh, but they flexed their muscle and it, like they did a black tile, their post was just all black and said, we're going to be removing content. Our, you know, we, our photographers had to be supported. And that was enough to really get the conversation going about this around the world and Matt and, and Instagram backed off uh, fairly quickly after you saw that. Um, and I think that's what they're trying to spur now, um, but we haven't seen a lot of traction on that. I think the, the, the lay of the land is very different eight years later uh, here in, in 2020 uh, right. with monetization and whatnot. And there's a lot of other things at play that weren't at play back then. In 2012. Yeah. So that's, that's interesting. So I guess with one fell swoop, Instagram can make this whole thing moot. Um, and it's just a matter of, you know, listening to all sides and trying to figure out something that, that, that is helpful for everybody. But actually, James, you said something really interesting. Um, uh, until that day happens, until Instagram does change their terms of service or, on, or this case resolves um, with, a, uh, with a actual, you know, at the end of the day, um, before then, you said that it would possibly and I'm not holding anybody to this. This is not legal advice. It's possible that you would be, as the photographer or the owner of the copyright, working within the Instagram terms of service by placing on the photograph that you put on Instagram, come at me, bro, with, you know, licensing if you want to use this photograph. I guess, is that, is that kind of, is that, did I understand that correctly? That, that possibly you're working within the, the framework and letting the world know that you can't use the code for this photograph. Uh, the, the short answer is we don't know. Uh, one, one interesting point, you know, because we have the benefit of um, Mashable's lawyers wrote their position uh, to the court last week, and they're very fine lawyers. I mean, they're, they're, they're tops in their field, you know, for copyright uh, uh, type 
you know, type, type litigation. Um, what they suggested is that if a photographer did that, that posted their photo on Instagram and put you know, requirements on it, and then Mashable you know, didn't have the right to go use that, you know, they, they suggested in some respect that that would be non, nonsensical, uh, or it, you know, it creates this sort of, Mashable gets the license to use the photo, then the photographer you know, who has maybe put a restriction on it, on the caption, says, no, you can't use it. Uh, I mean, basic contract law, which, you know, as any of your, your clients or you know, wedding photographers out there know, uh, you know, the, the contract, you know, the contract construction or interpretation is so important. But, you know, when you have conflicting terms of Instagram saying, Mashable, you have this photo to go in bed, but the photographer is saying, no, you don't. Uh, because the photographer has a different purpose of being on Instagram. They want um, publicity. They want to display their work. What wins at the end of the day? And, that, and that's what we'd really like to know in terms of uh, either Instagram clarifying those terms or in the absence of them doing that, um, is a court going to you know, side with, you know, with us and agree that that's, that gives the photographer some sort of peace of mind that they can put that placement on there? You got to keep in mind too, and it's one thing that Brian and I always have dealt with over the years when we've dealt with copyright infringement cases is, you know, you, one of the defenses, oh, there was no watermark. Oh, there was no copyright symbol. Well, guess what? None of that is required. You, you take a photo, you don't have to put a copyright symbol on it. Yes, it, it, it gives the world notice that Joe Smith or, 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 or Sally Smith or whatever the photographer's name is, uh, ha, you know, has their name attached to it, but the effect of putting that qualification or that restriction on it, you know, it, 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 it butts up against, you know, the requirements of the Copyright Act to begin with, but does it have any effect within Instagram? I think, you know, we're all waiting with bated breath. We're going to find out, hopefully. Yeah. By the way, there's another case pending right now, you know, that's alongside us in New York, um, that was filed by a photographer by the last name of McGruckin against uh, the Newsweek uh, publication, their online publication. That's got very similar fact patterns, and you know we're uh, you know there's there's a potential that those two you know our two cases you know converge you know at, at some point because they're dealing with the very same issues of a publisher you know um, not abiding by those requirements uh, that we think you know were available in our case. So. Guys, can you can you talk a little bit more about y'all's specific case that that were you know the the genesis of why we're even talking today? Like, what what are some of the interesting points that are going on? Why is it, why did you take this particular case and and where where are we seeing this? Where is the case at procedurally? What what can our viewers like? Oh, in like two weeks, will we know something? In six years, will we know something? Something like like that? Yeah. Brian, you want to take a stab at why we took the case? Yeah. Well, we, we, we represent Stephanie uh, uh, in a number of uh, copyright matters uh, and uh, we've worked with her for a number of years. Um, this was just, this is one of a handful that we had for her. Uh, this is, we've, this was back in 2018, it began and um, we notified them that this, this was um, a, a, an infringing use and, you know, and, and things got, uh, combative from there. Um, what differentiates this from a lot of the other ones? The reason we wound up filing this, a lot of the, if it was straight up used through the API, you know, I, I think we would have been much more gun shy about going ahead and filing this and really pursuing it with, to that level. But we had an additional fact here, which is the same as additional fact in, in the Newsweek case that's that's kind of riding alongside of us in the Southern District in New York. Uh, and that was that they asked, I think as James mentioned, that they, they uh, had somebody from Mashable had reached out, uh, I think it was a, an intern even, uh, to Stephanie in 2016 and asked, this is, they were doing an article on female photographers and asked to license a picture of hers for $50. Um, and, and Stephanie uh, um, did not give permission for this. Uh, and a week and a half later, they turn around and they published this article. Uh, and instead of using a licensed image, they went ahead and did the embedding feature from Instagram to get around that, um, since they didn't have permission to license an image. Um, and when the, she didn't immediately discover this use, I know she's she's a 
globe trotting you know, professional Nat Geo photographer. So she, you know, she didn't discover it uh, until a couple of years later. And when we went looking back through the email communications, we realized, oh, well, they asked and were denied. And, and you know, what, how does the Instagram terms of service get around that? And so that, that's, that's the unique fact here that we're battling that's different than a lot of general API kind of snatching and using somewhere. Um, and, and that's why we felt this strongly enough to go ahead and file it and pursue it to this degree. Gotcha. Um, okay. And then, and then where, where are we at now? Like where, where's the, what, 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 what happened with the case? Like what's going on now? What are we waiting for? Sure. So as, as Brian mentioned, you know, the, the case started in 2018, uh, one of the important things for photographers to keep in mind is um, whether you're doing this yourself, which I don't recommend, or using an experienced copyright uh, infringement lawyer to uh, assist you is to understand that, you know, sort of the, the initial back and forth, particularly as it relates to the DMCA, which is uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and that, that, that basically gives you online, you know, various online rights uh, as a photographer, is to paper your file in a way that the other side, um, you're either telling them take things down because I own this and you didn't have the right to do it. And as you know, Brian mentioned, um, it, you know, it got, it got contentious where we had early on made it clear to them in writing, guys, take this down. You don't have the right. She already denied you the right to publish that. And the way. Instagram is currently set up as you've got private versus public account settings. But in order to have a business account, which you know, any photographer that wants to measure who's going onto their site, if they've got an opportunity to, you know, to sell third party products or you know, do promotions, um, there's no way to do that and to, and to measure those, um, those quantifiable you know, page clicks or views or likes or shares or, or, or what not is through a business account mm -hmm. on the public setting. And even despite Stephanie telling Mashable guys take this down, this is through their lawyers and this is through, you know, a couple of weeks of back and forth, Mashable refused to do so. And it wasn't until I believe, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, Stephanie changed her account to private that it, uh, it, it, you know, when that happens, the, the embed feature dies. It basically cuts off the connection and no longer, uh, it no longer works. So if, if we take a step back and go all the way back to the beginning of the case procedurally and not to get too boring into the, you know, the wonky, you know, -ness, we ended up amending. So, so changing the language in our complaint several times, which the court allows you to do. And, uh, they filed a motion to dismiss, which is basically asking the court that they say, we have all the evidence and documents and contracts we need to see that we're right and they're wrong. So there's no depositions, there's no fact discovery, there's not this, you know, when people envision litigation, there's a, a host of different tools that lawyers can use to figure out what the heck the other side, you know, has in their possession, what evidence, what Instagram would say. We, we have no evidence in the record of, Instagram's position. So everyone is dying in the world to know, Instagram, what are you really doing here? You, right. you, you're a big meat, you're a big technology platform that goes and gets everyone to voluntarily put all their this free, amazing content, um, you know, created by photographers onto the platform. And then you're basically taking all that amazing content and giving it away to the mashables of, of, of the world. And Procedurally, we really focused on attacking how convoluted uh, Instagram, or, yeah, Instagram's uh, contract was was written, the terms of use. Uh, so much so that there was a study in the UK that found that to order to to um, to have a meaningful, you know, to be able to digest those terms of use, you'd have to have a PhD in lingu linguistics. I mean, you're talking about thousands of words piercing together you know, three or four uh, different uh, contracts. Of, of the Instagram terms of Correct. service. They did a study Correct. literally on the, wow, okay. <laughs> Correct, but even despite that sort of, my gosh, this is the most convoluted, legalese, nonsensical thing that anyone could, have. hiring lawyers, we couldn't even figure out, you know, you know, to a reasonable degree of certainty that there was, uh, we even had a contract. So we attacked it on those grounds and the court said, you know what? 
Instagram, you could have made these clear, you could have made them more concise, but you, we found the courts like the court said, we, there's language in here that says you gave away those rights to, to Instagram and in turn they have the right to give them to Mashable. But upon further reflection and two years passed, no, 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 hardly anybody knows this, but our, their, our original judge, Judge Deborah Batts, God bless her soul, she, she passed away at the end of February and she hadn't made a ruling on the case. So we sat for almost two years not knowing what was going on. COVID-19 hit, the case got assigned to a, to a new judge, Judge Kimball Wood. Uh, and you know, within three weeks or so, she issued her opinion which didn't come down in our favor, but that gave us a lot of time to have a lot of, what I'd say, armchair quarterbacks, uh, but great legal minds that we, you know, we reached out to and ultimately did our own independent due diligence. And we figured out, wait a second, you know, there are other things in here that the court clearly missed that Mashable was supposed to play by certain rules. And we made, you know, we tried to make it as clear as, as day that, you know, these rules, like the 24 hour takedown rule where Stephanie had gone to the other side and said, take this photo down. They didn't, they refused to do that. The restriction rule, which we talked about earlier was putting the caption on the photo or in our, in our case, we had emails expressly denying the right to use the photo. They ignored that rule. And then there's another rule that I think, you know, we're, we've brought up and, you know, whether it's a winning argument or not, we've asked the court to consider. Uh, but to, you know, to sort of finalize that point, where do we go from here? You know, the court could take two weeks, two months, two years again, God, heaven for, for a bit, we, you know, it takes that long to, you know, to make a, to make a ruling. Um, one thing that I think everybody wants clarity on is the um, Mashable's lawyers have joined in our request for oral arguments. So, uh, there's a there's a decent chance the court could come back and 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 allow us to uh, re-argue some of these positions because if we don't then you know we're still weighing whether an appeal is the right way to you know to go or it's possible in that time Instagram makes changes and like you mentioned earlier it's a moot point and yeah you know we yeah Stephanie doesn't get to you know claim victory in her case but in a way she does, she's had, we, we've, we've got the benefit of, we've been the lawyers that have stuck our necks out and, you know, ca maybe caused Instagram and their lawyers that, you know, probably work at Facebook or the, you know, the, the parent company there and said, okay, we see that a, you know, there, there's confusion in the marketplace. We don't want to be part of litigation. We want to give people, you know, certain rights, you know, and they'll figure out a way to make money on it because that's what, you know, that, that their whole purpose of the platform is to do is to monetize, you know, advertising and that sort of thing. And maybe we're going to get the change that we want, you know, and we've opened up that dialogue and that conversation. Great. So if, so if I understand correctly for the, for the listener, um, Brian and James as attorneys for the photographer filed suit, a copyright infringement suit, just like we've been talking about. There was um, a response to that to that lawsuit, and then what's I guess simply be be motions back and forth about whether or not the merits to the case warrant continuing, and that was delayed due to the passing of the original judge in that court, and then um, the Miss Sinclair, the photographer, um, got a ruling against her essentially that would say you know there is no merit to the case based on the terms and conditions of Instagram, which I'm sitting here Monday morning quarterbacking saying it's ridiculous. So um, James and Brian in the past two weeks from actually producing this episode, by the time it comes out, it'll probably be a month, but have filed motions to say that opinion is wrong. Here's a legal basis why it's wrong. Um, and they want the court to reconsider that ruling because some factors were not considered. Now, um, when, and, and, and uh, as James just mentioned, both sides are, want to argue the case orally in front of the, the, the court. So that means coming down to the courthouse and then the judge is like, okay, what do you got folks? And then they argue their cases in front of them, the motion. Okay. So if hopefully fingers crossed, um, Miss Sinclair and uh, your humble guests on this podcast today will win the motion for reconsideration, which would mean 
that somewhere down the road, there would be a trial. Am I wrong about that? Is that correct? Possibly. There's, there's still- If, if there's no appeal, if no yeah. appeal, there would be a trial on the merits of the case. Yeah, it, it, would, it would get into discovery. And that's not to say that uh, the, the case is, is, is won. You know, there are still defenses that right, they right. Could bring up and motions for summary judgment, which is right before, you know, at the close of all fact discovery generally, the court allows both sides to come forward and say, you know what, there's no facts in dispute here. And here's why we win. They still could, they still could do that. So, you know, we're not, you know, we're not popping champagne yet. Right, right. No, I wasn't saying that. Like, there's a lot of work ahead of you guys. And so that's why actually I'm, I appreciate you coming on because when I asked you to come on, you're like, Rob, hang on, man. I'm writing, I'm writing my motions. I'm writing my briefs right now. So I'm like, oh, you know, do what you got to do. And then we'll, we'll come on the show. So, well, James and Brian, you guys are doing, in my opinion, you're doing excellent work. Like I'm, I'm clearly prejudiced to your side of the case. So I'm glad that y'all came on. I'm, I'm fingers crossed for a successful um, resolution to this um, for Miss Sinclair and for photographers everywhere. Um, if, if anybody out there that's either watching this or listening to it, if you have gone through something similar, um, you feel free to reach out to our guests, James or Brian or both. I will have their information in the show notes. Um, and and uh, yeah, I say show notes, I guess if you're listening to it, if you're on YouTube, check out the, um, the description, their, their information will be down there. So reach out to them because I mean, like, you know, maybe this happened to you and, and, and these, these guys are on the forefront of these issues. Let me just tell you, like, it's hard enough being a lawyer. Then you gotta like learn. Okay, what 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 does a photographer do? What you know? What's a good photograph mean? Like, what's all that mean? And then you gotta learn code. Give me a break. So, <laughs> these guys have been doing this for a while. They are on the forefront of it. So, if 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 you find yourself in this situation, these are the guys that you're gonna want to talk to. Um, James and Brian, guys, thank you so much for being on the show. I, I've enjoyed it, so I'm gonna be listening to it if anybody. So, I, but I think that we 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 tackled some interesting stuff. Thanks again. Uh, thank you so much for having us on. It was it was a pleasure. Yeah, lo lo love to rejoin you anytime. We've got another uh, another case like like this that could hopefully change the world for the you know, for the better for for all content creators. Fantastic, folks. If you enjoyed the content of this episode, please let me know. If you have any questions for Brian or James that you would like me to ask them in a future episode, let me know that too in the comments below. Leave a review, like, and subscribe to the podcast. I would really appreciate it. It helps me understand uh, what content you want, what content you don't want. Um, keeps it fresh. So appreciate that. And um, as always, stay safe out there. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Wedding Industry Law Podcast. This podcast is intended for general information only. Nothing in this podcast is intended to be legal advice. Do not rely on this podcast for your legal matter. Instead, consult an attorney in your area. Thanks, obrigada, até semana que vem.